I would like to start by introducing uh, Yvonne. Yvonne Odiambo War is a Kenyan author, lecturer, and art curator. In 2003, she won the Kane Prize for African Writing for her story, Weight of Whispers, a breakout story that immediately signaled her great gifts and announced her presence on the African literary scene. Her novel, Dust, uh, which I really, really love, was published in 2014 to wide and global acclaim with translations in several languages. It received the 2015 TBC Jomo Kenyatta Literature Award. Her second novel, The Dragonfly Sea, published in 2019, was an extended display of the range and multiple dimensions of her aesthetic powers, narrative genius, and lyrical wisdom. <laughs> narrative genius. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm staring before the new manuscript and thinking, oh, am, wow. I worthy? <laughs> am I worthy? <laughs> you are, all of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a vulnerability of the artist before the new, the, you know, before their blank stage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I understand. <laughs> Reviewing Dust in the New York Times, Taya Selassie wrote, in this dazzling novel, you'll find the entirety of human experience, tear shed, blood shed, just uh, lust, love in staggering proportions. Ron Charles of the Washington Post wrote, a war demonstrates extraordinary talent and range in these pages. Her style is alternatively, uh, alternately impressionistic and harsh, incantatory and propulsive. One moment she keeps us trapped within the blooded walls of a torture cell. In the next, her poetic voice soars over sun-baked plains. She can clear the gloom with passages of Dickensian comedy or tender romance. But most of her novel takes place in haunted silences. Dust moves between the lamentation of a single family and the corruption of national politics, swirling around one young man's death to create a vortex of grief that draws in generations of deceit and Kenya's modern history. I'd like to add that Yvonne Wars' marvelous novel contain, novels contain and execute their potency, not just with dazzling narrative structures, but with a symphonic architecture. Her language on the page and in your ear moves with the ache and surge of ancient songs, wails, groans, and chorus of snatched fragments. Like the forward and backward crash of waves, the grain of our stories are revealed in that space between the forward and backward movement of memories, voices, histories, the consolations citizens invent to stay alive and survive the brutal ruins and myths of nations. Uh, we are delighted beyond measure to welcome you, Ivana Wars. Thank you for making Thank you. Time. Thank you so much. And thank you for the, uh, the glowing <laughs> <laughs> heralding. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer, thank you for making time today. Uh, Jennifer Nancy Buga Makumbi. Yes, uh, is a Ugandan fiction writer, her first novel, Chintu, who won the Kwani Manuscript Project in 2013. Her second book is a collection of short stories, Manchester Happened, for the UK Commonwealth Publication, and Let's Tell This Story Properly for the US and Canada, Canada Publication, but came out in spring 2019. It was shortlisted for the Big Book Prize, Harper's Bazaar. Her third book, The First Woman for UK and Commonwealth, uh, UK Commonwealth and a Girl is a Body of Water for USA, Canada publication, came out in autumn 2020. Jennifer is a recipient of the Wyndham Campbell Prize uh, in 2018. She won the Global Commonwealth Short Story Prize uh, 2014 for her short story. Let's tell this story properly. I love that story so much. She is a Chills International Writing Fellow and a No Nice Residency. She, is a PhD, she has a PhD from Lancaster University, which is a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. Leslie Nakarima, writing in The Guardian UK, described Chintu as a beautiful book that gives a snapshot of different temporal realities of Uganda's history through characters who bear and burn with the weight of history. Chintu has been hailed as the great Ugandan novel, and deservedly so. Uh, while Makumbi documents the Ugandan history story, she also sub subverts Ugandans' uh, understanding of who they are as people. Uh, somebody's... Uh, Somebody's microphone is off, mm -hmm. uh, is on, and so I can hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, Chindu has been hailed as the great Uganda novel and deservedly so, while Makumbi documents the Ugandan story, she also subverts Ugandans understanding of who they are as people, questioning the popular conceptions of gender, religion and mental illness. And she looks at patriarchy, not through the consequences it may have for women, but from the male perspective. All but one of the six sections are told from a man's point of view. The result is a book that like Makumbi's subversion of the chin to me, examines the burdens of patriarchy on African men without blaming women. Please welcome uh, Jennifer Makumbi. Uh, Jennifer, thank you uh, for making time. Uh, both of all- Thank you for yeah. the introduction. And it is so lovely to meet you for the first time. I've been a big <laughs> fan, but it's, it's, it's wonderful <laughs> to meet you. Uh, it's to meet you all, but also I've seen so many people signing on. Julianne, I'm so glad you're on. We're going to talk. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, it's exciting. <laughs> so both of our guests have engaged themselves with the task of asking a very important question of our century, which is what, you know, we are going to talk about today. What is a nation? what is a country and i i just want to dive right in and maybe uh, start with you yvonne um <laughs> what like well, how do you define a country how do you define a country maybe we could begin there you know i'm no longer defining a, a country i'm 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 a kind of i'm on kind of creative rebellion stage uh against uh uh, not necessarily anti the nation state as much as or wondering what uh, lurks as new possibilities. Um, I find I, I, it's uh, it, it's not it's not an, it's not a new tantrum. Uh, there have been others, uh, finer souls who have expressed the same tantrum against the the nation state and its um, uh, its impulse to create this kind of uh, fundamental nationalisms. Uh, these radical nationalisms that destroy, um, you know, as Rabindranath uh, Tagore, you know, uh, I, I mean, he, 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 his own kind of thing. He, I think, what does he state? I'm not, I'm not against one nation in particular, but against the general idea of all nations. Um, I'm more curious about the possibilities of um, uh, uh, humans organizing themselves. Um, in a way that centralizes, um, uh, you know, the, the the values and ideals that uh, uh, honor the earth, and and in some ways, not not in not not in the kind of uh, autocratic and hubristic way, but also cent centers the human being. The idea of uh, of a state in the service of the human being, rather than the human being in in the service of the state. Um, so I guess it, I guess it's a kind of it's a place of flux and fluidity for me. Um, uh, so I'm not sure I'll be able to define the nation yet at this stage, but it's probably an anachronism mm -hmm. given the age. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you for that, uh, Jennifer. I'll throw the same question to you. Uh, how do you define a country? What is a country to you? Before. Before Yvonne started talking, I was sure of what a country was. <laughs> now I'm questioning my ideas and my views about what a country is. I know what a country is. Uh, the ideas have even disappeared. Um, <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, now following on from what Yvonne has said, I think it, it becomes difficult really as a person who comes from a country that was formed not organically through our mm. own actions, but yes. it was brutally formed and enforced on us by outsider graces. And having realized how um, traditional communities and traditional nations are resurfacing now, you know, mm. after 50 years of this uh, false notion of Uganda, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and realizing that every time I think about Uganda as a nation, I tend to be def to define it from where I am mm -hmm. or in terms mm -hmm. of position. So mm -hmm. when I'm in Britain, I am so aware of Uganda and I'm so aware of Africa. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I return home, 
the idea disappears and I just go back to my clan, you know? So, um, I, but I, in the beginning, I was so sure Uganda is a republic and it's a nation and it's made up of these uh, uh, ethnicities and we have a language, which is not ours, which is English. And we have a culture, which is not specific, but you know, a collection of cultures. So in a way, now that you've worn through that out, <laughs> You, you know, I, 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 I am now questioning it. What is a country? What is a nation? Uh, perhaps I'm more comfortable with nation mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. a country, country because of my uh, origins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I also just uh, had to pause there when Yvonne uh, Talk about her idea of country because this is how we are going to start cars by the way you know but i did like what, what you say about uh the idea of centering uh the human being i think if there's anything this year has taught us is to kind of rethink mm. the way we exist in this world and you know some of these things that we think we know um and i'm just very curious uh, and this is for the two of you oh but before i go to that question i just want to um encourage uh, all the attendees please if you have a question for Yvonne and Jennifer uh, uh, leave it on the Q&A section uh, is it a chat box uh, yeah <laughs> so please uh, prepare your questions and we uh, will share them with our panelists uh, but Yvonne and um, Jennifer I'm just uh, curious how I imagine this idea of a country or a nation has kind of uh, morphed over time and I wonder how this idea about what a country is uh, has shaped your novel, in this case, Chintu for Jennifer and Dust for Yvonne. You know, mm -hmm. even in the gestation, gestation period and eventually as you began to write, you know, how has it shaped your writing or just this particular, your first novels? Okay. Um... As I said before, had I been in Uganda, perhaps Chintu wouldn't have shaped out the way mm. it did. Um, but uh, the minute I stepped into Britain, I became mm -hmm. so aware of my being Black, of my being African, and of my being Ugandan. Mm -hmm. So had I been in Uganda, I would have written this book as a Muganda. Mm. Not as a Ugandan, but what the minute I stepped out of Uganda and I was in Britain and I was aware of my difference, but I was also aware of how, for example, things like my name Jennifer did not belong to me, my language English did not belong to me. Those things become so sharp and you, you suddenly get this, who am I, where am I, why mm. am I? So in, in a way, um, my stepping out of the country shaped my country for me. And from that moment on, I started to write and um, perhaps in a little bit uh, militant way that, that I own this Uganda. This is mine. Nobody can take it <laughs> me. I am African regardless of what you say. And I am proud to be African. And so <laughs> that awareness then in a way shaped that novel. And I was going to write about Uganda the way other people have written about Britain or mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. And I was going to, yes, as a novel, I'm going to look at what is wrong and I'm going to put it out there for the world to see. But by God, I'm going to write very proudly about our wrongs, <laughs> about our ugly, about <laughs> our beauty, you know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, for me, immigration shaped mm. the way I look at Uganda. It shaped the way I write in such a way that now I'm no longer writing to the world. Mm -hmm. For goodness sake, I'm writing to Uganda, I'm writing and, uh, yeah. to Africa, and I'm writing to Africa. Anybody else, you can fall in line. If you can't, <laughs> step out of the way. <laughs> you know? So it, it's, it's, it, it's all of that, um, uh, that colonization and migration 
in a way shaped the way I wrote about Uganda. I decided quite immediately that I'm not going to have the British in my book. Of course, the echoes would be there, but they are not going to occupy any space in my book. So I, in a way, all of that shaped my country for me for the first time and how then I brought that country into G. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about, you speak, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just curious how distance, is it because that distance between, uh, exposes you to mm -hmm. certain uh, maybe stereotypes or certain narratives that you one wasn't aware of when they were here like i'm just wondering what it is about distance that makes us aware and leads us to making these decisions about you know what we are going to write about by we i'm just inserting myself in your narrative mm -hmm. at this moment. <laughs> but i'm just curious what it is about distance yeah what distance does first of all it gives you objectivity okay mm -hmm. you are no longer so close to your to work mm -hmm. you know so you're far away and you're looking back at it and then what distance does is that you are uh, surrounded by a different culture and therefore you're going to write comparatively mm -hmm. oh they are this we are that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah most of all what it did it did was nostalgia mm -hmm. that longing Mm -hmm. that desire for home so all of that distance does that for you, for the novel but the most important thing is the distance in terms of objectivity that mm -hmm. you can look at your weaknesses in a particular way that you can see your strength in a particular way but that is comparative because i can mm -hmm. see what the british are doing well compare mm -hmm. with uganda and then i can unleash then I can see what British are doing wrong and compare with Uganda and I'm like, yes, you know, that's. <laughs> I, I would say distant, distance, uh, just to drawing from my own experience, distance turns you into a kind of forensic pathologist mm -hmm. and your country be, is the coughs that you, you can, you can, you can perform an autopsy on. And you know, the idea of, or the original meaning of autos, ops, autopsy is a kind of, uh, uh, it's a very cold and clear, uh, engagement with truth that is laid naked so and uh, so there, there is that and and you look at the 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 country that's become a corpse or a zombie <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that you have to contend with uh, also because uh, I think the those the the other thing about distance and I don't know you know if that's also what happened to you mm. and I, it was it was I met a yeah I met a uh, an ex Loretto a uh, Valley Road woman who lives who lived in New York, and she was one of those who graduated who left uh, Loreto uh, Valley Road. I think a couple of uh, probably you know over thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and she had come to one of my events in New York, and she said something so poignant that you, you that said uh, that you know that you know entered my own heart, and it's something that I, I recognize. The world we were given it's it's when you the way the world is framed you kind of go into the cos cosmopol and and imagine that it's 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 big it's grand all these things are of the aspiration of the big world mm -hmm. what she said what she told me was she says she went she landed in america and realized that the the world that we lived and were was and, and were given was much bigger than the world that she met out there mm so they're the, the, because they're, they're this yes they're they you know the things there's so many things we take for granted and walk you know the idea that i can uh, walk into a hindu temple in one of the streets of nairobi pop into the uh, i don't know uh, you know visit a mosque and, and do so with this kind of ease this kind of move ease of movement that becomes uh, politicized and 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 uh, you know exceptionalized in other spaces these little things. Yeah. But anyway, back to the original question of uh, how does a country form the novel? Um, I'll start with uh, actually the novella, The Weight of Whispers. That was yeah. that was kind of my return back to Kenya. And uh, a bit like what you're going through, the idea of coming back home after roaming the world like Malcolm Magridge's Satan, coming back home and then finding that home is not home. What uh, an old friend called Inzile, the encounter of Inzile. When you're at home, but yet you're not. Yeah, but 
when you come home, but home is not home. And then there's nowhere else in the world that feels like home. So it was a kind of reckoning with that um, displacement within the part that, that be, a displacement within something that was supposedly familiar. Um, and then negotiating the, the, that particular ease. The next one, of course, Dust is very much a book that was formed by, driven by, and, 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 and moved by the nation. Um, and it comes from the crisis of the citizen, the artist, a citizen, encountering it, her nation, her country, um, setting itself alight. All the, exception, all the exceptionalism, all the bullshit we had believed about ourselves, all the framing that was supposed to be part of the identity formation coming apart before our eyes and, and we're helpless before the, the flames. Um, that, that, created, that was an that was a, that was a incredible, both psychological and, and emotional crisis. But quite frankly, that was the time I also found myself to be a thing called Kenyan. Hmm. The risk of losing the country the awareness that a human being, uh, as human beings and people, we can lose a country, that made me Kenyan, and 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 I guess dust comes from the whole kind of that the you know inspired by that whole season, and and trying to make sense of of uh, what it means, um, what does it mean to be a, a human in Kenya at that particular time, mm -hmm. and and what does the humanity of the other in Kenya at that particular time mean. And, and what do we do with the, uh, uh, to be Kenyan, I realize is also to be complicit in silences, in, in, in the ghosts, in, in, in locking up the cupboards where we know that skeletons are rattling. Yeah. Uh, and it was to make sense of, um, am, I going to am, I, am I going to be part of the complicit community uh, that locks up, that says accept and move on mm -hmm. so that our wounds are still bleeding behind closed doors. And, and then the third book, of course, then kind of expands the, the notion. It, it, it's informed by my own experiences of working in Zanzibar and encountering the sea, the ocean, the Swahili seas. I think some of you call it the Indian Ocean in, in, in interesting ways. The, 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 the sense of peoples for whom, who look, who read the world from the sea, but these are our peoples too. Mm -hmm. uh, the sense of peoples with such long, long, long histories Histories before the idea of Africa even came into being. Um, the, the idea that there are uh, fluid identities uh, that are not, uh, that are not, uh, what do you call it, are not woven from the terrestrial space, but from the waters. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the ease with which they can say that, yes, there are family, there's family in Yemen, there's family in Gujarat, there's family in, uh, in Kerala, um, and, and you're seeing this family while you're speaking from the East African shore. So mm. these, these become part of, you know, I guess, a place belonging and, and, and identity formation, especially through geographies, informs a lot of my, all, all that, each, each one of the texts in interesting ways. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. And just as a follow up, Yvonne, um, you, I love this word you taught me, insel. In style, yes. Uh, in style, yes. Uh, but I, I wonder. I know. I, I remember reading dust, and um, I remember just feeling like, oh my god, the dust is like I can smell the dust. You know, the the way mm -hmm. you describe landscape, and I know landscape is very important to your writing. And in an interview with, I think, the common, you talk about Kenya being the, you know the humors from which even your desire to write emerges. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about this, you know, your, the relationship between your writing and landscape, the landscape of the country, how that shapes your imagination. Um, mm. Just for dust and for dragonfly. The dragonfly sea. Um, yeah. the, and, and it's probably returning to some of the things that Jennifer was um, uh, alluding to. Yeah. Uh, the, the sense of uh, not a separation. Um, my own cultural milieu did not separate nature from life, from the human being. Um, the, 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 the amputation comes uh, with the uh, imposition of, uh, you know, the imperial imprimatur. Um, so these become things that one questions. Um, I grew up, um, my own parents, uh, raised me very much uh, in a way, part of, part of our family ethos is that, is that which people call uh, conservation. Um, I'd call it something else. 
um, maybe it's a relationship with all aspects of, of life. Yeah. Um, the, so I, mom, mom used to, when mom, mom would take, would send us to sleep with stories of uh, mountains that talk and hyenas that laugh and, 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 and spiders that scheme and and the, and the and the soil is not a neutral place. The the the, the soil that eavesdrop, and, and I guess that then flows into um, uh, not only the text but belonging and being of Kenya, um, of being of this particular geography with its splendid um, features, its variety of spaces, and uh, the sense of uh, of I think I think you we use the word humus. The sen the sense of the the earth. To which uh, one is uh, one is how to say it? One is tied. Maybe tied is not the word. Where my umbilical cord is buried. Yeah. Where my <laughs> umbilical cord is buried is also if 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 I can think of myself as a tree is also where my roots, a uh, kind of root, my roots are, and, and that becomes part of my engagement, my conversation with um, this landscape with 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 Kenya, uh, with Africa is a conversation with its. Um, geographies thank you thank you for that uh, i see the questions are coming in please uh just a reminder uh if you have a question for uh, yvonne and for jennifer uh type them in the q and a chat box or whatever uh mm -hmm. jennifer i just want to return to something you said earlier uh something that uh you know now that you are writing from um not from uganda you decided to do with your book uh you decide to refuse that to bow to the obligation or that's placed on historical african novels that obligation to include the colonial <laughs> and i mean I, I imagine that you've been asked this question a lot of times uh, because the <laughs> chintu is very audacious in that way and i wonder if you could maybe speak to us a little bit uh just more about why this was very important to you uh why why this decision why was this important well um it happened when i started to teach english what they call English uh, out here at um, <laughs> university level. Um, so we were looking at all sorts of texts um, and I noticed whenever they were dealing with um, things fall apart, um, they were dealing with colonization. Mm only colonization. And I remember going back to the book and checking when did the white man make appearance in the text? And it's much, much further in the text. The mm -hmm. text, were, um, as I don't know about you, but in Uganda, and we studied this book at all levels, L, all level, A level, first degree, you know. So, but often we were looking at how, um, um, the fear of fear raised a conquer to the heights and then the fear of being a coward brought him down you know mm -hmm. and that anxiety in a man and, and, and the ideas of being a man yes there was colonization but we mostly focused on that and I remember my teacher in all level talking about how Africans allowed colonization to happen so there was a sense of blame mm -hmm. to ourselves when we were studying this text. But then I noticed in the West that they were not considering Okonkwo as a man, Okonkwo as a father, Okonkwo as a husband. Mm -hmm. It was, look what we did. These people were wonderful. They were having a good time. And then we arrived and we destroyed everything. And I thought, hang on a minute. No. <laughs> But that's not true, and that's not what Achebe is doing. It, it, that yes. Yes. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. But I realized that the West was so obsessed with itself in our text <laughs> that it was going to peripherize everything else our cultures, our, you know, everything that was going on with the Igbo was put in the margins, and all was centered on Europe and Europe's action in the West. And I realized, oh my God, you can write about your culture, you can write about yourself. And this text will travel to the West and still they won't hear you. <laughs> it's, it's all about them. 
it doesn't matter how bad, mm -hmm. how terrible what you say, as mm -hmm. long as you do not ignore them. <laughs> and I say, yeah, oh, I'm interested in you looking at how we are. <laughs> You know, what, what, what we are, we are beautiful, we are ugly, we are stupid, we are clever, we are dumb, we do this. And, mm -hmm. and I would like you to see us that way, mm -hmm. rather than focusing on yourselves and oh, how bad, terrible you are. <laughs> and that's the point at which I thought, okay, I will remove the rest. Mm -hmm. And I remember after the novel came out, I, I was invited to Oxford University and I met this dawn the kind of white middle-class man you don't expect to read your book very well. <laughs> but he had done, he had read it very well, but he decided to say that, you know, Jennifer, you might have locked the West and Britain out, but the more silent you were, the louder I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just can't win. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Yvonne, is that something you think about? You know, is that something uh, you think about with your novels? In the writing of Dust, for example, is that uh, like colonial? How do you interact with this colonial past? No, uh, I, I only, I've, 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 I've maintained that uh, uh, colonization as, uh, the, the, you know, and it, it's, it was a, a one, a recent phenomenon, a brief phenomenon in the longer history of the continent. It was brutal, it was vicious, it was traumatic, especially because of its um, uncommon violence, its intrinsic evil. And this is, that's a whole other topic that needs uh, its own kind of discussion. Uh, the, the, the evisceration of, of people, of nations, of souls. That, that, that's a whole other conversation. But it's, it, it was not, and, and I think Jennifer points it out. I, and, and, I, I, and maybe subconsciously had started my own kind of quiet and very polite rebellion earlier on. As I tell some of my um, um, Occidental friends, you're not that important in the long, longer history of my continent or my peoples. And the stories that I look at, I look for the histories of the interstices, the histories that be, are, that are embedded in, uh, in, in places of our long history. So, you know, the new novel I'm working on is around coffee. About coffee histories, it's coffee. It's coffee and it's history, and it's incredible. It's an it's it, in terms of the research process, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. But the you know I, when I want to when, when, and I, and my conversation is primarily with um, um, the the Africa oriented person who is interested in the shadows in the in the in the spaces of our, our of our of our willful and also the absences in big histories. When I, when, when, when you know, let, let me take an example, just a brief example of the, of the coffee story. People forget, completely forget that uh, we know about, uh, you know, coffee as Ethiopian, but people don't, people seem, we seem to have forgotten that coffee is also uh, Central African and Congolese. When the when the Dutch uh, coffee plantations were, uh, were were devastated by the coffee berry, they replaced it by with with uh, with uh, with crops from from the Congo. So it's an incredibly African, as an essential African forest spirit that um, is uh, you know. So so it's a kind of engagement with the histories in the ways as much as I can um, of the place without making any apologies or concessions to what has uh, you know to to what happened later on. Um, so that question that Jennifer has, I'm in a in a in a very odd way. I'm experiencing it with the dragonfly sea, but I did not set out. I, it's I'm not in. Like I said, it's not that important. The ox, the West, the Occident is not that important in the in the if one immerse, immerses oneself in the bigger trajectory of of, of the continent's history, um, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, I, I refuse. I I. I um, I don't, part of my disengagement is I don't want to, as, and, and as Jennifer points out, in spaces, even of, in, in, in uh, liberal spaces, they love to talk about whatever we do, they love to send, put themselves, make sure, look for themselves, even, even to say how bad and terrible and wicked they were. 
as long as it's about them. So that conversation is cannot be had with the dragonfly see really. And I'm I, and I wasn't I I was not aware that I had the the oxidant hadn't shown up. Okay, maybe maybe I was. Maybe I was a little <laughs> bit just a little just a little bit. <laughs> But it's inevitable in the spaces of Europe when I went, you know, where the book is. So it's inevitable that that question will come up. Did you set out to deliberately exclude the West? The correct answer is I wasn't even aware that they were not there. <laughs> uh, perhaps I would like to add something to what I said before. Yes. That, uh, I'm aware now having been published um, uh, for probably now seven years, I'm aware that the powers of the market yes. and how the markets are shaping the African novel. Mm. Um, uh, you're aware that uh, we are not in, in charge of our canon. We don't, we are not, choosing what books that belong to the canon and what doesn't. That all of it is being decided out here because someone decides what books should be published, okay? And someone out here is editing those books. Someone out here is agenting those books That's and someone true. is selling them, okay? Now, and that someone is not Af us, it's not Africa. And that someone is a business oriented person and they want to make money. Yes. And so they will ask which book will sell, mm. okay? And that book, uh, the market is not African. W w they are not yet looking at what books will sell in Africa until the African market tips over and we, we reject certain books and we accept certain books. Out here, the books that are going to come out will be edited and marketed and done for the market mm -hmm. out here because this is where the money is, okay? So this yes. is why people like me are going to have fights with editors. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is why people like me will have an African editor first who will tell me fight for this. You can let that go before I go to my publisher. Mm -hmm. But that, all that is, uh, I'm not saying that the publishers are here, uh, you know, nefarious people with nefarious, whatever. They are businessmen and women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they are going to sell their books to the British, to the Americans, because that's where they will make the largest profit. Mm -hmm. And what does the British and the American looking for? They are looking for themselves. Because even us, you know, yeah, I don't know about you. When mm -hmm. you watch a movie yes. and you see six people and one of them is black. <laughs> yes, the one that will die. <laughs> the one who the dies one is the one that will <laughs> Or look at yourself when you watch the World Cup. Yes. As soon as the African countries are out, you start counting how many black people are on a team. And that determines whom you're going to support. Support, yes. 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 Now, people yes. do not deny, I know we do this. Yes, <laughs> yes, we do. We so, do. We are always looking for ourselves in these spaces. It's yeah. the same with white people. So they are looking for themselves in our texts. So when you write a book that is uh, talking about colonization or neocolonization, that book is going to sell. Mm. It's going to sell because they are there. Now, then comes Chinto. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it was published in 2014 in, in Uganda, rather in Kenya. In Kenya. But it was published 2017 in America. Yeah. And I live in Britain. And it had been trying to be sold to everybody who rejected it. But then someone in America reads it and gives it a star. And the following day, I swear to you, I got more than Four offers in my email box from oh, people oh. who rejected it. Interesting. Hmm. Exactly. So we need, as Africans, we need to think about the canon. 
We need mm. to think about how do we reclaim our canon? We need to think about what books are they publishing and mm. why are they publishing them? Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. There's a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, mm. I, want, I just want to maybe just go to some of them. Uh, and this one is for you, Dr. Makumbi. Uh, from Duncan Mwangi, who is just to add to what you have been talking about. Uh, Duncan asks, I've been thinking about your claim about post-coloniality selling and often ask myself, is this observation includes the Ugandan and Anglo-African market as well? And how you think about the market for such literatures to African audiences? Uh, um, I, I think the Ugandans are looking for themselves in my book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they are not interested in anything else. Um, when I talk to Ugandans, what I hear is, oh my God, I can't believe, you know my family? You know my family? <laughs> Everybody in that book was about. And then another one says, oh, but it, it, you knew where we lived? And then I could walk around the hills and I thought, oh my God, these hills are being talked about in a book that is international. There was mm. that sense in Uganda that if you're going to write a book that is international, then it should be about New York and London Bridge mm. and <laughs> Statue of Liberty. And they couldn't believe that Katwe and why you say, you know, and the hills of Kampala are places of reference. But again, this is exactly what spurred me on because long before I left Uganda, I knew about uh, New York, <laughs> you know, yes. Times Square. I knew about the Statue of Liberty. I had not got on a plane. I knew about London and I knew about Buckingham Palace. And I, and all of you who have not traveled to the West, you know no. places, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how, how did the British and the Americans imprint these things into your mind? And this is how you bring your money out here. You know, the minute you get some money, you want to go and see the Statue of Liberty, spend the money there. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Mm. And, and to show you how important this is, I've heard of an American who has gone to Uganda with Chintu and say, look, I'm going to see these places. Mm -hmm. It's that important. Yeah. Mm. You know? Or someone who say, I'm going to arrange a Chinto tour mm. around Kampala. This is how we're going to make our landscape important or relevant. It doesn't have to be awesome. It doesn't have to be wonderful. It has to be something that we love. Mm -hmm. The way we write about it, that mm -hmm. makes them wonder, what is it? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these, uh, I think this question is also very related to what you were saying about canon, the African canon. Shingai Kagunda asks, I love the idea of reclamation of the African canon. And I'm also wondering if we can get to a place where we can dismantle the canon. Um, I guess, yeah, do y'all think we need a canon in the first place? Hmm. <laughs> this one is for the two of you. I like that question. Okay, the canon is constructed. If we wanted to dismantle it, we could have, and and it, it's it's inevitable. It's inevitable that it will um, acquire a different shape, form, and 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 sound um, in 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 the next couple of years. Um, the, the the other work that actually does need to be done, and I think it's already happening, is the the production of the of of, of the literature um, from the continent or from those that associate or are linked to the continent. Um, the, I said, if you, if, if, if I think uh, if we keep, to remember that the canon is a human construction as well, and it is, and it is mediated and curated and defined and then announced. And once it's announced, everybody then repeats that which has been announced and suddenly it becomes the reality when a little bit of critical thinking will say, okay, um, what do we want? Uh, what do we desire? How, how, how do we take over the canonical spaces? And it's also a marketing scheme, mm. <laughs> 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 the, the, the canon. So 
Yeah. On one hand, you want to dismantle it. Yeah. On the other, someone who's selling books is going to say, top African novels, you know? Mm. And, and uh, things fall apart. And you want to say, no, 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 out of God. <laughs> that, it, it's a very um, funny beast, the, the canon. You, you, you fight it and it engrosses you and it takes you into its cycle and you try to fight it within, but it, it, it just carries you along like a flood, you know, <laughs> because it's, 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 it, it comes from the sense of, oh, which is the best book, you know, mm. which are very uncomfortable. That it's a very uncomfortable language. The best uh, books of uh, 2020. Yes. Mm. The best selling mm. novels. Oh, mm. women's best books. <laughs> you know, mm. it's all taking us into, uh, and, we, and we are going unconsciously into creating a canon. But it's actually a selling, it's a gimmick. Quite, yeah, it's a marketing gimmick. So mm. we, you can talk about dismantling it. Because a canon is a, a, in a way a dangerous thing because then it determines and it eliminates and it, it, it excludes, you know? And on the other hand, it's the same people who are fighting it who will put it forward. Mm. <laughs> mm. 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 I mean, I, I always thought there's a danger of, you know, when we have these conversations about like, oh, people are writing too much of this or people are reading too much of this book and there's always that danger of like in the process of dismantling a canon creating another canon you know which kind of ends um up imprisoning us or whatever you know uh but that's a thing i often think about uh there's a question that's coming a reminder please send us your questions uh i just decided to interrupt the conversation because some of them were very related to what yvonne and jennifer were saying um this one is uh for you for you jennifer and uh, yvonne the two of you uh from yvonne at uh yvonne is asking do you both think that uh, the redrawing of the african borders that is as they were before the scramble and partition of africa berlin 1884 would resolve our problems around nationhood versus statehood Ooh. okay i'll go first yes. um, i think the borders will dissolve organically. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think we are going to sit down and start to say, oh, that border doesn't exist, this border doesn't exist. But mm. I think, again, it will be market processes mm. that are, are going to drive them away. Because in, in a way, the immigration is starting. Okay, immigration within Africa. And that is going to distort things. Even mm, yes. structure lines, even along ethnicity. And ethnicity in Africa is stronger than the national borders. Mm -hmm. But I believe uh, the uh, capitalism and the markets are going to drive us in such a way that people are going to look for jobs look for places where uh, the, the better education um, services, where there are better uh, medical services. And those are the places they are going to settle. People say that it will be the cities. I don't know um, in future. But what I'm sure of is that these borders are so unnatural that one time I was watching the, um, the Olympics and I was in the bedroom. And my husband was shouting, Jennifer, there's a Ugandan winning. I said, no, we okay. Ugandan, we don't win long, long <laughs> distance races. Those are Kenyans. <laughs> I, said, I swear he's Ugandan. So I ran out because I swear when a Ugandan is winning anything, I am there screaming. <laughs> his name was Kip, Kip something. Kip, Kip. <laughs> That's a definitely a Kenyan. Oh, Kenyan, forget yeah. it. That's Kenyan. <laughs> And then, and then somewhere he ran across the road, grabbed the Ugandan flag, and was like, what? <laughs> the name is Ugandan. But that is the nature of the borders, mm -hmm. that people yes, who are yes. related are in different countries. 
people who are related to Ugandans are in South Sudan. And I mean, that country, it's, uh, I mean, uh, it's so bad <laughs> that for me, I stopped <laughs> thinking about that border in the North because families are across, you know? So those borders are just going to disappear whether we like it or not. But along mm -hmm. which lines, I'm not sure. I suspect markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I've always sort of to, about... to... Sorry, Bonnie. No, I was just going to, just, just to uh, add on to what uh, Jennifer said, there's the, yeah. there's the dis dissolution, but I'm wondering if certainly the, uh, the new generation, the the I call them the cyborgs, the the, the generation that have grown up with techs, who yeah. are already um, operating with, with a kind of uh, new sense of either uh, what do you call it, maybe borderlessness through the uh, through the uh, through the internet. I'm I I I have every faith that that um, uh, attitude, the that 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 um, uh, impulse will transfer itself into their geographies that at one level. But secondly, I'm hoping that there'll be a convergence, a kind of intentional um, uh, reimagining of the African boundaries and borders. Um, I mean, in the same way that Africa, were, uh, the borders of Africa were, were unnaturally um, imagined and, and, and built around uh, economic interests or land grabbing by, by stra very strange Europeans. I'm hoping that there, there can be an intentional, uh, an intentional reimagining of what we want um, for the African continent going forward. I don't know if we've ever asked ourselves as, 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 pe as not just as countries, but as, as, as people, connected to the continent, what do we actually want to be? And then how do we want to look? Uh, and, and what would it take in, for us to, to realize the, the, the ideal that um, we call forth? I was, I was gonna say that uh, something Yvonne mentioned, uh, not Yvonne, uh, Jennifer mentioned that made me think of uh, Busia border, that town. I, yeah. I don't think there's anything as confusing as, you know, being in a border town. <laughs> so those questions are like, but what money do you use? What what language do you speak? Or at what point do you know that you're going to a shop in Uganda? And, you know, they're, they're very confusing. And when you're in that uh, space, you really begin to ask some of these questions. It's, it's quite confusing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just to move us from, I want to take us back to something uh, we spoke of, distance, a while back. And uh, Aisha Haji has a question about this, uh, regarding the question about distance that uh, Ndinda asked and how, influences, how, how it influences writing. My question is, would you consider this gaze in conflict with those who are unable to travel and get this distance? And how do those, these two gazes of Africa influence the kind of writing we get out of Africa? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, very interesting mm -hmm. question. Jennifer? Um, could, you, could you repeat the question, the uh, first part of it? Yes, mm -hmm. so it's uh, about the question of uh, distance that we, we were talking about distance and just like how it gives you perspective uh, and you begin to see some of these things. And Aisha Haji is asking regarding the question about distance, uh, and how it influences writing. My question is, would you consider this gaze in conflict with those who are unable to travel and get this distance? And how do these two gazes, I imagine, you know, one from people who are writing from within uh, the continent and others who are writing from outside the continent, how do these two gazes of Africa influence the kind of writing we get out of Africa? Um, that's a very difficult question. I think that's why I asked it again. Yeah. <laughs> at first I thought I hadn't understood it, but I understood it and I, ha I had failed to formulate an answer to that. Mm. How do they, the gazes conflict? But, but my, my idea of gaze mm. is already based on, on the African continent. You know, um, um, I, t I tend to ignore the gaze out here. Now, what happens is that I, then I give them my writing to someone who is African, but British as well. And then that one, you know, actually turns to 
adjust to uh, uh, in order for British people to understand or American people to understand. So how do those gazes um, influence my writing? It's imaginative, you know. Mm -hmm. The gaze that is African, I imagine it. I can't experience uh, a people on the continent and how they are reading my books. That is impossible. I am just imagining that they would read like this. And normally what I do is to go back to who I was at 15, 16, 17 and write to that person and imagine that the people on the continent would be able to relate to mm -hmm. that. But at the same time, being an African who didn't grow up on this continent, it's very hard for me to imagine the gays out here. I cannot experience being white, you know. So uh, <laughs> perhaps I'll go back to Yvonne's word in Zion. Um, <laughs> and I'm writing from uh, a, such a very uh, unstable position, but it's a position that I'm going to have to accept mm -hmm. because I have no alternative mm -hmm. that I'm already here I can't, I can't undo myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful I line. I can't myself. undo myself. That. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the idea of all this, of the constant, uh, I, I, the artist and the citizen always negotiating uh, with him or herself, um, the, the place of, of belonging and the place of exile. And sometimes they might be even the same place, you know? Um, in response to the notion, the question of the gaze, um, I, I imagine uh, if it's directed at one who has not traveled and yet who is writing and is thinking of writing the country, uh, there's so many ways, there's so many, how to say it, there's so many types of gazes. Uh, there's the inner gaze and there's the outer gaze. And there, even within your own home, uh, you can find distance from that which is familiar, from your from your from your house in uh, um, I don't know from your house in Kilaleshwa, you may find distance from the city center, and 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 and, and experience that, um, and, and write from that kind of the, you know the sense of distance. You can go to another part of the country, and feel alienated and and outside off, and and in 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 living and being in that place, looking back. Mm, at the rest of the country, uh, it, in the in, in dust, it was going to Turkana or uh, going to Loyangalani and looking from that center, Loyangalani center, and looking as if I am off Loyangalani, looking at Nairobi. And and you know when you go to Loyangalani, the question still remains: Abaria Kenya, how is Kenya? <laughs> so yeah, the, the distance is also within home, within the place of home, and uh, it takes the artist, uh, the the writer, the the visual artist to travel, to, to go on a tour of those spaces of distance, distances that are familiar and very close to us. I think there'll I, be I amazing want, stories there. Yeah. I wonder if type also sometimes allows us distance, you know, letting certain events that we are writing about sit for a minute and then uh, writing about them um, after we've kind of processed and thought about them. And I want, I'm asking this question because uh, Yvonne Dust came very close to the events that it was describing. Uh, mm -hmm. And my question is just how that experience was like writing something that, uh, had just happened recently. Mm. Um, mm. Like how, how, how easy or hard was that? Um, it was, it, <clears throat> Dust itself was a seven year project. Um, yeah. I thought it was going to take two weeks, um, but it started in 2005, not, not 2007, when I was walking in the streets, Nairobi streets. You remember the time of the referendum, those of you who are Kenyan. Um, and I, um, you know, it's the kind of walking, walking up and down the streets and eavesdropping in conversations, which one does. But I remember the conversations in the kind of the street parliaments, the impromptu gather, ga gatherings, was more fiery and more full of rage and 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 a, a sense of marginalization than that which the media and the press was putting forward. So it was when I wrote the first, uh, not quite draft, maybe it was probably, uh, it was likely to, to be honest, a polemic. And I remember giving it to B. 
Binyavanga, the late Binyavanga, who's he's, who's very much my parameter, and he said, Yvonne, this is shit. Um, uh, but but he says, I, I I get what you're trying to say, but this is crap. Yeah. But it al it's almost as if it needed us, and, and in a way that, that when I wrote it in 2005, it was almost like uh, you know that chicken lick and the sky is going to fall on Kenya's head if we do not deal with the silences, if we do not find a coherence between what people are actually saying and what the media is reporting. And, and uh, we need to come to terms with that. That's what I thought in 2005, 2006. Then we, and I said, and I thought if we don't do this, we're gonna set ourselves alight. And in 2007 and 2008, we did. So I think dust needed that experience in order for it to find it, its face, um, its voice, its rage. Mm -hmm. um, because it became very personal and e emotional, the emotions or, you know, all those things we talked about a little earlier, the, the reality that it is possible for human beings to lose a country. I think it for me, it clicked, ah, so this is how, this is how to lose a country. Uh, this is, and, and, and at that time we were heading, out, I, just a brief anecdote was um, around that time we were heading out to Tanzania on, on a different project. And remember when the plane landed, the Tanzanian authorities at that time asked the Kenyans to stay behind. And, and we, we, we disembarked last. And, and I remember being bullied um, by the, the customs officials. I just, we were a whole, a whole bunch of Kenyans uh, being told, ah, so you, you're the ones who are burning your country. Now you, you, brought, your, you brought your problems here. And I, I remember the sense of ra helpless rage, thinking that People actually are not interested in you when you lose your country. And I think there are so a lot of that does, the, the, the story of dust is also informed by the fear, the awareness of, of this other reality that one had never experienced before or ever imagined experiencing um, linked to the fact of belonging to a country. At that moment, I couldn't say I was a Nigerian yeah, or, or a whatever, you know, mm. or, or an Albanian or whatever. But at that time, you're a Kenyan. And at that moment, you're wearing your country's uh, wounds in a very public way uh, before human beings who don't necessarily embrace that um, woundedness um, in, in hospitable ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, Yvonne.